Welcome to Rochambeau, the podcast about unique competitions and the extraordinary competitors that make them happen. I'm Kim. And I'm Ted. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. This is a bonus episode, guys. It's a bonus on Bo. So once upon a time, we did an episode about the Frozen Dead Guy Days Festival that takes place in Nederland, Colorado. Right. And the festival has a great competition that's kind of the backbone of it called the Coffin Race. And it's just what you think it is. But without dead people. Exactly. So we really encourage you guys to go back and listen to that episode prior to going any further with this bonus episode, because believe me, you will get so much more out of this. Yeah, this will not make any sense. It's barely going to make any sense as it is. It's going to make even less sense if you don't know the rest of the story. That's true. So quick little recap, because hopefully we've lost everyone now that hasn't heard it. Bye. Bye. See you soon. And for those of you who have, a quick little recap. Grandpa Bredo, frozen on ice up in the hills of Nederland. He needed people to, well, he didn't need it. His no. family right. <laughs> <laughs> needed people to continually bring ice to keep him frozen. Right. And one of the people that we talked to during the podcast was Bo Schaefer, and he was the keeper of Grandpa, the Iceman, the ice for... Man. Gosh, if I remember right, 17 years? I think so. Somewhere around there. So uh, Bo and I ended up chatting for quite a long time, and he's really funny and fascinating, and I got to use maybe 30 seconds of it in the podcast. <laughs> Most of it just didn't fit very well. So instead of making all of that audio disappear into Never Neverland and no one ever getting to enjoy it, we decided to release that interview for you guys right now as a bonus episode. We hope you enjoy it. Hi, my name is Bo Schaefer. I uh, was caretaker for Grandpa Brito for about 18 years. I uh, helped start the Frozen Dead Guy Festival and um, took care of a cryonic facility uh, along with my company and, my, and myself, we took care of a cryonic facility for um, almost 18 years, and um, then we retired. All right, so we got a lot of ground to cover. How did you get hooked up taking care of Grandpa? How did that originally happen for you? Okay, I originally uh, came across this job many years ago. This was all about 22 years or so ago when um, there wasn't a whole lot of Internet out there. We were just on uh, email lists. It was kind of a cool that you could send an email over your computer, and it would go all over the world. That uh, was pretty hip at the time. And uh, so I was on this list of uh, what's called the extropians. Um, they were a list of futurists. Uh, extropy is the opposite of entropy. So they were they called themselves the extropians and so I was on their list and one day I saw this uh, posting from a guy named Trigby which is a fairly unusual name and uh, I had seen the name in the newspaper locally and I thought well how cool is that so I just dropped them a line saying hey I see I recognize your name I've seen you around here and now you're in Norway and what did the uh, what did the email posting from him say uh, it was just a posting about some futurist thing. I mean, I just I noticed he, that his name on it was all that he had said. He had, that he put Trigby Balgi, which is like I say, an unusual enough name that I recognized it. And I just dropped him a friendly line, saying, "Hi, how are you? I'm 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 here where you used to be." <laughs> and uh, I got a letter back from him. And after a couple of exchanges, he basically asked me if I wanted a job. <laughs> and I said, "Doing what?" And when he described it to me, I was just starting out with a uh, a fledgling environmental company. And here was a uh, foreign client willing to ship money on a regular basis to have us do an unusual job that we were kind of uniquely qualified for. So I said, yeah. And that's, that's how it started. That's amazing. And you said you recognized his name from the local paper. Was there a story connected with his name that you knew? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, in retrospect, of course, it's easy to come across all this, but um, if you ever get a hold of the film called Grandpa and the Tough Shed, it kind of goes over all what happened. Um, it, this kind of happened before I came on the scene, so I learned about it afterwards. Um, they had had a big deal in the newspaper, and that's where I'd seen his name. I wasn't exactly sure what I'd seen it about. I just remembered his name. But they had deported him, and then when they talked to his mother, his mother had mentioned that there was bodies in the shed, and everybody freaked out. And uh, it created a whole shitstorm in Netherlands for, for months. 
and they and they pass laws saying you can't have frozen dead bodies in your property in Netherlands, which unfortunately, due to the fact that they never really stopped to think about it, when they pass the law, you can't really have a turkey in your freezer in Netherlands. It's against the law. It's a, it's a whole body, and it's in a freezer. You can't have whole bodies in freezers. They never really define the fact that it's only supposed to be human. Oh, that's a poorly written law. <laughs> it's also the basis for what they used to have a uh, frozen turkey bowl at the, at the festival. I don't know if they still do or not, but they had that, and that was kind of the origin of that, the fact that you can't really have a frozen turkey in Netherlands. So that law is still written on the books that way? It hasn't been adjusted? I believe so. I don't <laughs> believe it's been changed at all. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So after you talked to him and he hired you and your environmental company, or, or as he was hiring you, what was the exact description of the job that you guys would be doing? Well, well, basically, it started out being just transporting dry ice to this facility up in the mountains. Um, it varied. He, all, he wanted it for th every three weeks at first, which was ridiculous. After a few years, we got it down to once a month. And what we'd, we'd take up about 1,500 pounds of dry ice once a month, and it would last up there. But over the years, of course, we had to do some repair work, and then we started the festival and did tours and did a whole bunch of stuff afterwards. Started up the... A uh, International Cryonics Institute. And is that something that you were interested in already on your own, or was it all inspired by taking care of Grandpa? Well, as a scientist, especially as a biological scientist, I was actually aware of some things that a lot of people aren't aware of, like the fact that we have frozen critters and thawed them out, and they're fine. You but have personally don't. done that? No, I've, I've, I've read the research. Sure. I mean, I, I know about the research. There has, there has been cry, cryonic research done on uh, certain turtles and uh, frogs, and they ain't got much bigger than that, but because these things normally hibernate and can freeze and wake up and be fine. Well, they took a couple of them. They took a turtle in particular and froze his butt and kept him there for three or four months, thawed him out, and he seemed to crawl away fine. But, of course, he couldn't really fill out a form or anything, so you don't really know for sure. But the key thing is, is they're small. Mm. And the hard part with humans is trying to freeze the whole thing at once. Because if you freeze it too slow, ice spears form in the cells and, le and basically pierce all the cells. And the cells, you've taken a piece of meat from your freezer and after you thaw, it's kind of mush, not like it was when you put it in. Right. That's what happens. And so that's, that's the big problem with humans is that they are so damn big, it's hard to get them frozen. A small critter like that, they flash freeze it. And, of course, I mean, you've heard about them flash freezing eggs and sperm and things like that. I mean, they've been doing that to bull sperm and human sperm for 50 years. Do you, is, is cryogenic still something that interests you to this day? Well, here, here's the thing. Cryogenics means making cold temperatures. Cryonics means taking care of humans as they're being frozen. One is much more interesting. Yeah, so that, that's why there's been a lot of confusion about that. But cryogenics just means making super cold temperatures. Cryonics is keeping frozen bodies. Gotcha. So are you still interested in cryonics? Uh, yes and no. Only as a scientific curiosity because of some of its other applications. I mean, the application we're talking about here is pretty freaking ridiculous. I can get into the whole thing of reincarnation and, uh, and other lives and things like that, but basically, you know, even Grandpa Brito, we brought him in with some psychics, and they talked to him, and even he said, why the hell would I want that decrepit old body back, even if he could fix it up? <laughs> you guys brought psychics in to talk to him? Oh, yeah, several times, several times. A couple of them were actually real psychics, I think. And, uh, and they brought him over and talked to him, and, and you know, he said, you know, Chris, the first time I brought him in, I was a little concerned. I was running a, you know, a business at the time doing other things besides that, thank God. <laughs> but uh, I, I piss off a lot of people in my work, and I don't want to be pissing off dead people. <laughs> so I called the psychics up and said, you know, can we contact this dead guy and see if he, you know, are we keeping him from moving on or anything like that? Is there any reason I need to be aware of here? And uh, they come up with a couple of experienced psychics and a couple of novice psychics. And uh, we actually put it all on videotape. I had several hours of the session up there where they so tried to contact him. And, and the very first guy that contacted him said that Brito didn't even realize he was dead yet. Oh, no. He said Brito was actually skiing in Norway. And oddly enough, in, in my philosophies of reincarnation and why spirits stick around and things like that, spirits sometimes will stick around if they have quote, unquote, unfinished business. Mm -hmm. 
Now, it was, it was well known that Brito really liked to ski. In the last few years of his life, he couldn't ski because he was too old. And, but he would still go to the family chalet, and so I'm sure it kind of grated on him quite a bit that he couldn't ski. And the fact that when he died in his sleep like that, you know, fairly quietly died in his sleep, in my philosophies, it's quite possible that his spirit would stick around and ski for a while. I like and, it. and according to this uh, psychic, that's what Grandpa was doing. He didn't know he was dead. He was just happily skiing his beloved hills in Norway. And then, of course, the psychic brought him over and showed him his dead body and showed him that he was dead, which I don't know if that was such a good idea or not. But Oh, my God, I bet he was pissed. Well... There's a there's a rest of the story thing coming up on that. We'll see. But uh, so just to finish up the psyches, they talked to him. They asked him, you know, what the problem is. If you have any problem with it, no, he's got no problem with it. Brito didn't care, <laughs> and and Brito didn't care whether whether he was doing it or not. Like I say, it didn't bother him. It was just kind of curious. And so that was the gist of what what we heard when the psychics were up there. But the, the rest of the story is about a month and a half later, I went looking for these guys again because I had a couple of follow-up questions, and I couldn't find them. They had disappeared off the face of the earth. All, all of them? And it isn't just me. When I was looking, I found their offices, and I was looking around, and I ran into a guy, and he was their landlord. And he says he was looking for them. He says, and he says, they paid their rent, he says, but they've just gone. They've disappeared. I don't know what happened to them. I don't what know if that have anything what? to do with Brito or not. I don't know. I don't know. But a month and a half later, these people have disappeared. That's crazy. So, I mean, as a scientist, you know, I know cause and effect. It isn't necessarily tying anything together here. But on the other hand, I don't know. You bring a spirit over and tell him he's dead when he's happily skiing. I, you know, maybe, maybe he gets a little pissed. Who knows? No doubt. No doubt. Wow, that is a crazy part of the story that I did not expect to hear. Um, <laughs> so after he hired you, what was it like? Bring. What was it like the first time that you actually saw Weird. Grandpa? Weird as shit, not because of Grandpa, but because of the town in Netherlands. I would hide. When I went up there, I'd stop in a coffee shop. Every time, when I, by the time I get up there, it was about an hour's drive up there or so. Uh, it was an hour's drive almost from my place to get the ice and an hour's drive from the ice. So after two hours on the road, I'd usually stop for something, a uh, coffee and a snack at this coffee shop. Well, I'd go all the way back in the back and sit in the corner. Do that, nobody would see me and nobody know who the hell I was and what I was doing. Because, you know, don't forget, this was right after he'd just been, you know, run out of town and everybody freaked out and passed ordinances and everybody was all shook up about the whole deal. So for the first few years, that's, that's how I, I went up there, and I hid back in the corners, and I quietly slipped through town and, you know, tried to keep the load covered, and, and although I have a fairly identifiable vehicle, so it became a little difficult. In the f first few years, I didn't, but after I got this identifiable vehicle, it became a little difficult to snake through town. But that was, that was the year before we started the festival, so things had changed by then. So at what point did the, um, I don't know, town committee, the people who had said it's you know illegal to keep an entire frozen body, at what point did they make an exception for Grandpa? Well, they had nothing they could do about it. He was, ha, 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 grandfathered in. Ah, ha, 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 got it. He was, all, <laughs> he was already there. They couldn't do anything about it, the fact that he was already there. But I you see. can't bring nobody else in at, the point, at, at this point in time. And at one point, there was actually two of them there. I uh, explain. There was, there was uh, Big Al from Chicago was there for a while. There's a whole little story about that, how, how he got this crazy Englishman to help him, and they, it was a body in a freaking sleeping bag, period, exclamation point. One no, one no coffin, one no box, and nothing. It was a body in a freaking sleeping bag, and they took him uh, as he was frozen, and they slapped him in the freezer case with Brito for about, I don't know, a few months until the family, until this whole bruja blew up in Netherlands, and the family got wind of it, and they decided to bring Al home and, and bury him. Could be one to have this all be a paying proposition. He wanted to have a half a dozen bodies up there and have them all be paying to keep to keep the place running. So, what was it like up there? Was it what you expected? Well, when I went up there the first time, uh, you've seen these, like, tin garden sheds, have little sliding tin doors, you know, they're about six by eight, something like that. You've seen these sheds in people's backyards? Sure. Okay? That's what Brito was in. He was in a freaking tin shed, and he was inside of a kind of like a, a homemade wooden freezer box that was, that was half-ass insulated. And... and what happened over the year or so that I was doing it at first, it got to the point up there. I don't know if you've ever been. Where are you from, anyway? Um, I live in Atlanta, Georgia, but I spent my childhood in Jersey. Oh, okay. Well, you don't have any idea what the weather's like in Netherlands. I'm assuming very cold and snowy. Uh, 
uh, that ain't that ain't the half of it. Wind is where it's at. They get hellacious wind up there, and Trigby's place faces right right where the faces west, right where the wind comes. Oh. And I saw a piece of metal from that tin one day. Years later, I saw a piece of metal from that old tin shed, bigger than the the hood of a car. Oh. Of a big car, bigger than that, and it was up on top of this 12, 13 foot cliff face. The freaking wind had picked it up oh. and deposited it up on top. Oh my gosh! And that's the kind of wind they get up there. So this wind had just torn the living shit out of this out of this metal shed. It was taking me twenty minutes to get in and out of it because I had all these pieces of plywood screwed into it to hold it together. The door, the side, the roof, everything was all screwed together, and it was just about to, to still collapse anyway when Tough Shed came along and rescued us and gave us a Tough Shed and made a big deal about that. And that was kind of like the start. That's when st- shit started to turn around. How so? Um, everybody liked us. <laughs> Everybody thought we were we were we were great. I mean, we had we had a couple of uh, a couple of TV segments. Um, I forget what the hell they were, but some a couple of weird TV segments, strange and wonderful, or things like that. We were on TV a couple of times, and then the Tough Shed people did the shed for us, and then that, we, the festival started, and after that, we were everybody's darling. Yeah, it was an interesting transition on things, you know, going from pariah to hero. And right. so, were you involved with the starting of the festival? How did that come to be? Well. This started out that one day I got a phone call from Teresa, who was the head of the uh, Chamber of Commerce at the time up there, Teresa Warren. And she and their, the chamber were sitting around, and you get freaking crazy. Cabin fever, they call it, but I just call it plain old crazy. Up in Netherland, after the winter up there, people get weird. And so they really got to go let off steam. And so every spring they would have a spring fling or some kind of a party. Well, they were looking for some kind of a theme. And I don't know if you've ever heard of, of, of Henry the Headless Chicken. There's a, there's a town in, in western Colorado called Fruita, and they had a chicken that had his freaking head cut off and lived for about a year. This is a true thing. This is a true thing. And, and what it is, they chopped him and they left a very portion of his, of his lower brain, you know, like the automatic stuff. And it was enough to let the chicken run around. And they lived for a year. They poured feed down the hole in the top of its head, basically. And this thing lived for about a year or so, and it was very famous back at the time. Well, they have a festival out there. And so the people up in Netherlands were sitting around thinking, if you can have a festival about a headless freaking chicken, why couldn't you have a festival about a frozen dead guy? <laughs> and oh, that's so they obvious. called me up and said, what do you think? And I said, well, let's run it by Trigby and see what's what. And we did, and so that's kind of how it started. Wow. Wow. Um, were you involved in the festival the first couple of years? Oh, yeah, I helped start it up. I was the one that suggested tours, and the tours were the biggest hit and they, uh, for, for a long time. The tours were the biggest hit. So, I mean, every year we do tours up there, and people would come from far and wide. And, I mean, we were, we would get I, and some years 20, some years 25, and I think even one year 30 bucks a ticket. And mm-hmm. after every tour, I asked everybody up there, anybody feel they didn't get their money's worth? And I never got a reply of negativity. <laughs> How long would the tour last? Oh, usually about an hour, between 45 minutes and an hour for every tour. We, you know, we'd run them on the hour every hour, something like that, through, Friday, through Saturday and Sunday. That's and awesome. one year we had chocolate tours. Everybody got some chocolate. And one year we ran everybody up in limos. And we had what? all different kinds of things. <laughs> Could you give me the Cliff Notes version of what a tour would be like? Well, as you, as, you, as you drive in up there, you see the edifice. I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of what it looks like up there. I have. Okay, so you see the great thing. It looks like a castle because it's got the, the turrets up on top or whatever. And, and that was supposed to be the house. And then behind it sits a tough shed and another shed. And so people, they would come up, and then usually, uh, usually we'd go to the tough shed first and open up the shed. And, and I had special, I, one time they come up to do some refurbishing on the shed, and thank God I caught them before they were just about to oil the hinges. And I stopped them from oiling the hinges because it had a big effect. You open the door, and you let it go open real slow, and it creaks like, like, like any spookiest mansion you've ever been in. Awesome. <laughs> And that, 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 a lot of people got a lot of sound, sound bites on that one. But so we'd open the two big double doors of the Tough Shed, and then in there was a big wooden box, like, had a viewing stand on it. One year, uh, Tough Shed came up and built us little, like, risers that people could step up um, to it and actually look over, because the whole box is about five feet high. And so, and kids had a hard time. So we had this little, like, like a little riser in front of it with a step up on it, so you could step up onto it and file by and look at the box. And then I'd go in, and I'd open up the box and give my spiel on things, and, and 
And then over the years, we did various things. Occasionally, somebody would get in there with Grandpa and get their picture taken. And, and you know, sometimes we'd uh, pull out uh, once a year on the birthday, we'd try to pull out some birthday cake and have a piece of it. After about eight or ten years, it sure didn't taste like shit, though. <laughs> So I, so I so I can imagine Brito ain't tasting too good either. But yeah, well, yeah, one year, many years ago, we got we got some birthday cake on his birthday, and then we just put the remains in with him, and every year we pull it out and have a bite. <laughs> oh, my God. And so for years, once a month, you brought the dry ice up. What, what other rain, tasks were you done? Rain or shine or snow or whatever. And I tell you, I got some horror stories about that. There are times when my truck would break down, and I couldn't get it within 200 yards of the place. And we had to haul the ice up on sleds. Oh, God, that's awful. Had to haul you know, 1,500 pounds of ice up on sleds, you know, 120, 100, uh, 60 pound blocks. So we'd haul two, maybe three blocks at the most on a sled and have to haul it up this road. The reason we couldn't get up there is because the road was so snow packed and so slippery, my four wheel drive truck couldn't get up there. But you could do it on foot? That sounds well, terrible. Well, yeah, you dig a path, and, you know, you dig a path and you put on, you know, heavy cleated boots and stuff, and yeah, you could easily get up there. Oh my gosh, was there ever a time that you were like, this is so not worth the money? Uh, yes and no. I mean, it was never worth the money I'll, not that much, honestly. I mean, uh, we got paid okay for it. We didn't, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a money-making proposition. But we got more than money could, could buy out of that. I mean, the, the notoriety, the, the fame, the, 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 the festival, everything else that associated with it is, was, was worth the suffering. I mean, I, I can. I, it's it's funny. I, I have done this before. I have won bets in bars. I run up against somebody like uh, one day I met a hitchhiker uh, up in Fort Collins, which is a good sixty miles north of here, and he was from Netherlands. And so I so I looked and I said, "Hey, I'll bet you five bucks you know me." And he looked at me. I had never seen you before in my life. I said, "Well, that don't matter, but I bet you know me." And I've won bets in bars. I won the bet with that hitchhiker that day because when I tell him who I am, everybody knows of me. But nobody really knows who I am. I can walk down the street in Netherlands. Nobody recognizes me. That's that's really the perfect type of notoriety. Yes, it is. It's whenever I want it, and if I don't want it, it ain't there. That is just awesome. Wow. You have been so generous with your time already. I don't want to keep you too much longer. Is there anything else you want to tell me about the festival or about your care of Grandpa for 18 years that we haven't covered? Well, when the, the festival has had its moments. I mean, we were big on cryonics. We were billed as the Mardi Gras of the cryonics community for <laughs> many years. Well, the Coffin Races um, is the centerpiece of our podcast because our podcast in general is about strange and unusual competitions around the world. Oh. So we're so excited to have all of the back history of the town and your story to add to it. But truthfully, we are going to talk about the race a lot. Did you ever participate in the race? Well, I got like a, a couple of two or three stories about that one. Well, the, the first one is, you know that there's a similar competition down in Colorado Springs. I did see that, yes. Okay, and every year they send a team up here and we send a team down there. Theirs is in the summer, ours is in the, in the, or theirs in the fall, ours is in the spring. And so there's that competition. They have a downhill race and a coffin there, too. It's just the, the, their person uh, came up out of the ground and slid downhill in the coffin. And oh, our yeah. person is just in the coffin. We carry him around. But, uh, yeah, that was pretty funny when they first showed up there. They, they, they think the, the first team that won there was called the Manitutus from Manitou Springs. Nice. And they call themselves the Manitutus, and they all wore pink tutus. I love it. What are some and, of the team names that you've been on? Um, well, so so the second story about it is is that I had I was one time the uh, advisor for an explorer group, and we put together a coffin for the coffin races. In fact, it still hangs in my garage over here. And so the explorer people, uh, the explorer actually, there were boys and girls involved in it. They put a team together, put their smallest guy in the coffin, and they ran the coffin races. And I think they came in third or fourth, something like that. So that was pretty fun. But the most interesting story about competition is you might go online and look it up. There used to be a show, and it was called The Best Belgian. Okay. And what this was, this was, it was a show in Belgium. And what it was is that they would take this guy. He was a fairly well-known actor. And they would take him and run him all over the world and put him in competitions. 
And whether he won or lost, he would usually end up being the best Belgian in the race. And so that's where they got that's where they got the name of the show from. Well, he came to the festival and he ran in the coffin races and and went in the Grandpa Lookalike contest and one other thing I forget what the third thing was that he did, but he but he won the Grandpa Lookalike contest hands down. It was it was, it was he had he brought his uh, makeup artist. Uh, uh, assistant with him, and she did an outstanding job. He looked like a frozen dead guy. I mean, it wasn't like Grandpa. He was a frozen dead guy, <laughs> and, and it was it was great. But that was an interesting competition at that time. I took him around. I helped him out with a couple of things and was watching him. But, yeah, he was in that competition to be the best Belgian. Wow, this story, man. What an interesting life you've had. Well, it's got its, you know, Andy Warhol talked about 15 minutes. Well, I kind of stretched it out into 18 years, but it was off and on a lot. <laughs> oh, Bo, thank you so much for making time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. All right, then. Well, it was good talking with you, Tim. All right. You have a great day, okay? All right. You too now. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.